So in this video, we're talking about supporters uh, of populism. So populism at the political demand side. Uh, most previous studies focused on populism on the political supply side, which basically means populism as expressed by political actors such as parties and individuals, candidates, presidential candidates. Uh, but recently, more and more attention has been given to populism as a demand side characteristic, namely populism as an attitude among individuals, so voters and uh, party supporters, etc. I discussed this topic with Stephen van Howard, who is doctor and political scientist at the University of Surrey and an expert in, in comparative politics. And together we've published articles on this topic, so supporters of populist parties in particular. Um, so in this video, we discuss our own joint research uh, on supporters of populism, uh, their characteristics, their political preferences also, and especially the role of populist attitudes, which is also a, a recently hotly studied topic. Um, so what can you say about that, Stephen? Can you explain what populist attitudes in fact are? So if we take a step back, I think what unites all these different conceptualizations of populism, whether you think of it as a Laclauian concept or a political strategic concept, is that you can, you can always discuss populism or they all discuss populism as a supply side phenomenon, as you already uh, said. And usually that focuses on politicians, political parties, etc. If you think of populism as an ideational construct, like I think we both do, so you think of populism as more of a set of ideas or worldviews, then you can arguably also think of populism as an individual attribute. Uh, and that's exactly what we've uh, kind of looked into. And most studies in this regard look at populism as an attitude. Um, there's quite a few studies, growing number of them, uh, that perceive populism as such um, and measure populist attitudes amongst the public. And the primary tool to do exactly that is, is a survey. Um, while there are numerous batteries of questions that supposedly measure populism, uh, the most common battery uh, it has been developed by Kirk Hawkins and then adjusted and applied in Europe, and more specifically the Netherlands, by uh, Agnes Ackerman, Kasmude, and Andrei Zasloven in their 2014 uh, CPS article. And let me share my screen to show you exactly the items that they have used uh, to measure populism in that regard. Uh, you should be able to see the screen right now. Yes, I do. Yeah. I am um, so they fielded the, the first six items that you see in this table, which together set out to, to measure populism. In later scholars, uh, in later studies rather, some scholars like you and myself, and as well as Cristobal Rovira Kaltwasser, I've added some items to this scale, which you see here as, as items uh, seven and, and eight. Before highlighting some of the findings from the literature uh, regarding these populist items, uh, it's worth highlighting that populist attitudes are very different from and perhaps even more complex than so anti-establishment attitudes or anti-elite attitudes. Um, populism isn't just about what's wrong with politics or who is to blame. Uh, for certain uh, misrepresentations across politics. Um, it is very much concerned about the power of the people and returning that power to the people. So anti-establishment or anti-elite attitudes, while a component of populism, they're much more restricted in their scope than, uh, than populist attitudes uh, are. I wanna, at this point, highlight four uh, findings from the, an extensive literature that uses these items to measure uh, populism or to discuss populism amongst uh, the masses. First and foremost, and perhaps most importantly also, is that there's numerous country level studies that range from the Netherlands to Chile that show that populist attitudes amongst the public are actually quite widespread. Um, this falls under what Casimir termed this populist zeitgeist idea, meaning that it's a very pervasive and very widespread uh, set of ideas. And it also means that populism in and of itself is a pathological normalcy, even at the, the mass level. A second uh, set of uh, findings that kind of come out of a very broad literature on this is that uh, populist attitudes, attitudes seem to be quite high uh, amongst the population. 
levels of populism are often found to be quite sizable and very omnipresent uh, amongst uh, uh, populations. And that regardless of whether populist parties, leaders, uh, politicians are actually present in a, in a country. A third commonality that we find in the literature, and I won't uh, extend, expand too much on this, is that while populist attitudes might be high and very omnipresent, they're not always or continuously uh, operational. So as a latent disposition, they need to be activated through a context or political cues. Um, again, what, yeah, what, or, what you basically mean by this, if I'm not mistaken, is that a lot of people do have these attitudes, but they're not truly activated. So they're, they're not necessarily the whole time that they're, that they're angry with the establishment. Right, so something needs to happen in order to wake up that latent attitude that, exactly. that people have. Uh, and most commonly in the literature, uh, populism scholars refer to some instance of purposeful misrepresentation. Mm -hmm. So you might always be populist, uh, but it's not until there's a massive corruption scandal in your country that all of a sudden these, these attitudes are going to come to the surface and going to play a role as you vote or support yeah. a particular exactly. party. Yeah, and if you look at this list of items, so this is basically how uh, populist attitudes are measured. So if people agree with all of these different statements, mm -hmm. uh, then you can say they are uh, marked by, by high levels of populism. So for instance, the country, the politicians in this country need to follow the will of the people. The, the will of the people is obviously a key concept when you speak about uh, populism. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or, so, uh, yeah. uh, a fourth um, and final uh, uh, kind of outcome from the literature, kind of very broadly speaking, is that populist attitudes actually matter and that they, are, they predict expressions of political behavior. Um, and that's something that you and I have, have looked into extensively. Yeah, so can you expand on that? Because you just said that populist attitudes are in fact quite widespread and high, they may be latent, so sort of dormant, sleeping, but nevertheless, there are a lot of people that, that, that have this, these populist inclinations. Can you then nevertheless sort of figure out differences between uh, support for different parties, for, for instance? Uh, in terms of uh, yeah, how, how yeah, the relationship between populist attitudes at the individual level and party support. Can you say a little bit more about that? Well, absolutely. If, if we look at this, or it's something that we looked at in both of our uh, articles, um, if, if we look at populist support amongst an electorate, if we just look at how high populist attitudes are, um, when we look at various electorates uh, of, of various parties, uh, we do come up with some uh, interesting um, findings. And let me show the next slide in order to highlight that. Um, this shows the kind of average level of populist attitudes amongst the different party family supporters. So in this regard, it's not really surprising uh, if you look down to the kind of middle of the graph that populist attitudes are strongest amongst the supporters for the populist radical left and the populist radical right. So overall, populist attitudes are highest amongst the supporters of populist parties. It's perhaps equally surprising as nationalist attitudes being the highest amongst the supporters of nationalist parties, but nonetheless, it's still an interesting uh, finding, one that was uh, not known to us up until some years ago. And I guess it, it also shows that this measure of populism, in fact, makes sense, or it is indeed, or at least an indication that it, it does measure the right things. Exactly, because if we look at the, the top part of the graph, we, we would expect that supporters of traditional or mainstream parties like socialist, liberal, Christian democratic, uh, conservative parties, that their electorates or their supporters do not hold high levels of populist attitudes. And that's exactly what, uh, what we found. Um, so as you said, it kind of, at the same time, it's an interesting finding, but it also confirms that how we've been measuring uh, populism is actually a good way of uh, measuring uh, populism. 
Yeah, so, so you, you, you see this kind of expected uh, difference between okay. supporters of populist parties and other parties. Does this also mean that you can say populist attitudes are kind of drivers, motivate people to su support these parties? Well, in order to kind of determine that, we went one step further and we ran a regression of with, where we look at various potential explanatory factors that might contribute to the support for uh, populist left and right-wing parties. We, it's important to highlight that we, we separate between left and right-wing uh, populist party support because we know that the electorates of, of both of these parties tend to be quite different. Uh, moreover, it's even difficult to consider populist parties as a very homogenous party family or a party family at all uh, due to their usage of, of various different ideologies. And in this regard, I refer to Matthias Rodin's extensive list of, of publications uh, to highlight this. So we looked at various uh, factors that, that might explain why people support populist uh, parties. And here is uh, a quick overview of uh, what, we, what we found. Um, let me, let me uh, start at the bottom of the graph. Uh, again, obviously, it's not very surprising that you know, populist attitudes are significantly related to the support for both left-wing and right-wing uh, populist parties. So, um, obviously, this is something that we've already emphasized in the previous descriptive graph, but it's also interesting to highlight that, uh, inferentially speaking, uh, that populist attitudes also contribute to populist support. Um, when we take a step further, though, uh, and we look at the, the different policy positions and different preferences of these uh, left-wing and right-wing populist party supporters, we do see some interesting uh, differences. If you look at the, the square right above the populist attitude, so again at the bottom, um, we see that authoritarian and anti-immigration issue, issue positions are related with support for right-wing populist parties and right-wing populist parties only. And it kind of shows that supporters of these right-wing populist parties tend to be more favorable of authority, of traditional ways of thinking about life. And that includes the dissatisfaction with the challenge to what is traditional uh, being uh, immigrants. On the, go ahead. Yeah, so is it this sort of, this also confirms indeed that it's very important to distinguish between right-wing and left-wing populist parties. So the common denominator might be that these, these supporters, uh, they have these strong populist attitudes, they are dissatisfied with elites, and they also believe that the elite should probably listen more to, to the people, but otherwise they have uh, various different motivations to support certain parties. Exactly, because if you look at the left-wing socioeconomic issue positions, mm. uh, here, so that's the second line from, from the bottom, here we clearly see that this relates to support for left-wing populist parties. Yeah. But at the same time, we see that there's no such uh, correlation uh, with right-wing uh, populist yeah. parties. So as a whole, uh, populist support is about a combination between, on the one hand, this commonality, populist attitudes and the dissatisfaction with democracy and elites, etc. But on the other hand, there's also a particular party policy oriented, program oriented, more ideological component to uh, populist party support. Yeah, you can also deduce from this that for left wing populist party support on the left head of, of the graph, you see that uh, being left-wing in the socioeconomic sense, so being in favor of more economic redistribution, that you might say matters for, for their support, where, whereas in fact for right-wing populist parties, uh, these, these supporters do not, do not seem to have very strong preferences either way on, on the left and the right, and they're much more motivated by these cultural issues, not least related to immigration and, and multiculturalism. Exactly, exactly. One other thing that's highlighted here uh, uh, is political interest. So uh, wh why is that in fact highlighted here? Well, that's actually perhaps arguably uh, one of the more interesting things that came out of uh, our, our paper here uh, is that political interest is positively related to support for populist parties. That suggests that 
populist supporters are actually quite interested in current affairs and politics in general, and that their dissatisfaction with how democracy is going and how elites are operating, that it very much makes them politically active rather than politically passive. So in this regard, you could argue that populist attitudes mobilize people, and it, it gives them resources, uh, rather than turn them into political couch potatoes, if you, if you will. Yeah. Yes, and this is quite surprising because populist supporters are often sort of depicted as uninterested or uninformed protest voters also. Exactly. Uh, and this kind of led us to, uh, to our follow-up project, if you like, because we wanted to look uh, more into this. Uh, if you relate support for populist parties with political knowledge, in fact, uh, often it's, it's said that, again, people supporting Trump or Brexit, often seen as uh, populist politicians and phenomena, that they know not much about real life, that they have a very distorted image also of reality. So we wanted to look at, well, is it actually in fact true that these kind of people are less knowledgeable about political questions? Or, and might it in fact be that they're also more misinformed? So I don't know if you want to move to this next topic, Stephen. Yeah, so populist supported misinformation. Right. And we, we asked this question, are populist party supporters less informed and also more misinformed compared with abstainers and supporters for, for other parties? And we kind of linked this question to these debates about, about fake news of course, uh, very much brought, uh, brought in connection with, with Donald Trump, uh, who yeah, we can show that he often <laughs> doesn't tell uh, truth or the Brexit campaign, which is famous red bus was rolled out. We sent the EU 350 million a week, which basically is, is, is not true, or the poster that Turkey was about to join the EU, which is also basically false. Uh, can you tell a bit more about what we did in this particular article, uh, Stephen? Right. So in, in this follow-up project, uh, which we did together with Javier Sahuria, with, who also is at uh, Queen Mary, um, we really asked to what extent that populist party supporters are less informed or even more misinformed compared to people who do not engage with politics who, or who even support for, for different parties. Um, so in that regard, we wanted to make a very clear distinction between the group of people who completely abstain from politics, the people who actually vote for more traditional parties, and the people who vote for uh, populist parties. What distinguishes uh, those different groups of people from each other? Uh, it's each of those different groups represents a different way of engaging or not engaging with politics. So for us, it was important to understand to what extent misinformation as a concept contributes to uh, that choice. So based on a number of political knowledge questions, which I perhaps won't divulge on too much, you can read about that very nicely in the paper, we distinguish between pe people who are informed, or so on a dichotomy, people who lack information and people who are very informed, so that means that individuals who, who have the correct political information and a separate group of people um, who might think that they hold the correct information, but in reality, they do not hold uh, the correct information. So they are by, uh, by consequence, they are misinformed. So by distinguishing between those two uh, groups of people, um, we wanted to kind of figure out to what extent accurate political information contributes to your political choice and also by consequence to what extent inaccurate political information contributes to your political choice and here is it or, go yeah ahead. to measure this uh, inaccurate uh, information we basically measure this by looking at those people that answer the question mm -hmm. but that answer it in the wrong way so they right. provide the inaccurate information so these are people that that presumably think. think they know the answer, but actually they don't. So they are the misinformed. And they yeah. are different from the don't know category because there's also people in the survey that say, well, I don't know the answer. So they're, they're neither informed 
but they're also not misinformed because they, they know that they don't know the answer. If, if and they, they recognize that they don't right. know it. And that's the, the crucial difference here, right? People who are not informed, they recognize that they're not informed, whereas people who are misinformed, they think that they have the information, but they actually have the incorrect uh, information. Yeah. So to give you a quick overview of, of what we found, um, I won't divulge too much on, on the different predictors. I want to focus on political information and political misinformation. That Those are the, uh, what is it, one, two, three, four, five and six, or fifth and sixth line uh, in that graph. And here, uh, we give you a kind of broad spectrum overview and we distinguish, first of all, on the left-hand side, we compare people who do not participate in politics with people who vote for or support a traditional party. And on the right-hand side, we compare people who abstain from politics with people who actually participate in politics but support the populist party. And here, uh, we very clearly see that political information stimulates party support. You see that in both instances, political information actually drives people to the electoral arena. It yes. allows people to vote because it's positioned on the right-hand side of that, uh, that uh, vertical line, meaning it's a significant effect. Yeah, this is the fifth, uh, the fifth circle from the top. One exactly. Three, so yeah, it's a, you need yeah. your binoculars here, but it, it does show it very clearly. Yeah, so it, it shows very clearly that uh, political information, so correct political knowledge, actually stimulates people going out to vote or going out to support uh, uh, parties. Um, if you look one line below uh, to the misinformation uh, line, there we cannot make uh, the same kind of uh, observation. We cannot really conclude that being misinformed stimulates the support for especially a populist party then. Uh, on the graph, you see that the confidence intervals of the effect sizes do not cross that zero line. So making the effect indistinguishable uh, from zero. In practice, that very much means that we have little to no evidence that misinformation contributes to populist support or non-populist support uh, for that matter. However, and that's the, the more important part, right? We went one step further because this is, let's say, counterintuitive because of what you highlighted earlier, right? Uh, misinformation seems to contribute to uh, the Trump campaign being uh, successful, to the Leaf campaign being successful, etc. So what we did here is we distinguished populist support even further and distinguished between left and right-wing populist support. And that's what we see in the final um, graph here in the slideshow. Um, we do find that misinformation, which is the one, two, three, four, the sixth line here, uh, again on the graph, misinformation actually increases the likelihood of supporting a right-wing populist party over a left-wing populist party. So if misinformation, if you are misinformed and you are going out and choosing between a populist party, you are more likely to choose a right-wing populist party than you are to choose a, a left-wing uh, populist party. And that's somewhat confirming what we saw or see in, let's say, contemporary politics. Yeah, and I think what we also found, if I, if I remember correctly, also when you compare non-voters or non-populist parties uh, uh, supporters uh, with these right-wing populist party supporters, you say, see the same effect. Exactly. And misinformation yeah. only has this effect, a positive effect on, on, on supporting a right-wing populist party. Exactly. And why that is, we, we can't really tell for, from our data. We can also not really say whether this is due to misinformation campaigns because this is not what we could measure the only thing we measured was whether people uh, gave a correct answer or, uh, uh, or or not right so we put a lot of uh, context and we downplay uh, very much the, our, our findings it's an interesting finding but we also realize that it it's not an a purely inferential uh, finding it's a uh, it's an interesting finding considering the current debates, uh, especially 
considering the higher levels of misleading information, fake news, inaccurate analyses, etc., that we observe in today's politics. Um, but we do think that it's one step that is taken and that many more steps need to be taken in order to figure out what the actual effect of misinformation as a concept is on politics and on party support more generally. Yeah, but yeah, but sort of going back to the previous finding again, sort of summing up, it's important to recognize that populist uh, parties uh, or uh, political knowledge, uh, it, it has a positive effect for both supporting non-populist as well as populist parties. So again, here, here this co common wisdom also seems to be wrong, if you like, that, that political populist party supporters are, are um, that they are uninformed or that they need couch potatoes that they don't care. So we need to be very, very careful there with, with making such assumptions because our findings um, seem to disconfirm that. Yeah. And maybe being careful or one of the things to take away is that we should be careful how we label these populist supporters or the electorate of these populist parties because very clearly uh, in both of our joint work and other scholars with us, their characteristics and features are much more complex than we would originally uh, anticipate or have thought. Yeah, so whatever you think of them or whatever you think of these parties, we, we should take them very seriously and also the, what, what they express in, in elections. Oh. So yeah, I think we're, we're pretty much out of time. Maybe there's a lot of more research to be done. Perhaps we should think about maybe a, a third paper at some point. Uh, but I'd like to thank you very much for this, uh, for this interesting conversation about, about our own work, basically. More than welcome. Uh,